Thank you, Father Roberto, for giving me this opportunity to share our common journey through the Lenten season. I kindly invite you to stand up, to say a few prayers, to ask for the aid of the Holy Spirit that we need, especially when we come to reflecting upon our own lives and our role in the Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let's join together in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can be seated. Dear friends, first of all, I think we have to regard ourselves as very fortunate of, or if I am to use our Christian language, as a very blessed people. Think just of this opportunity. Every Lent is a very good occasion to realize exactly who we are before God, but mainly and even more importantly, who God is before us. Everything that He has done and everything that He has promised to His very loved people. It is a real privilege to have some time to spend reflecting upon our, our own lives in the light of God. There are many ways of looking at human life. A biologist, or a surgeon, or a trade man, or everybody could see human life and human activity from very different perspectives. When we think of ourselves in the light of God's Word, we are trying to grasp something that is really essential, something that will last not only for this life, but even beyond. And that's a great blessing. Today, we are to focus on this title, the battles we are already in. This is a very special feature of the Lenten season, and we shouldn't forget that, that Lent is time for fighting, or if you prefer, time for training. People go to the gym to become stronger and to become healthier. I like the comparison between Lent and the gym. And I like to say that this is our spiritual gym. We have a spiritual exercises. What we are doing right now is exactly that, spiritual exercise. And all the same, 
as it happens in the gym, you need effort. I do know for sure you needed some effort to interrupt your activity, your normal, your ordinary activity in order to come to the church and to pay attention to the Word of God. That entails some effort. You have to do something. Probably things that you have decided to do, you have now postponed. And that entails some kind of burden for you. And that's an exercise. But doing this exercise for you and for me is good. Because that way, we're becoming spiritually stronger and also healthier. And that's the whole idea of Lent. On the other hand, we are in very good company. We are not alone. It is the whole Catholic Church and even more people that take this time of reflection and this time of prayer with some seriousness. People like the Pope, for example, he takes Lent seriously. You know that after the first Sunday of Lent, every single year, one of the busiest person in the world, I mean the Pope, does his spiritual exercises. We cannot say that the Pope has nothing to do. He's very, very busy to the top of his capacity. He's very busy, but even having so much to do, having so many tasks and pending duties in his agenda, he's ready to leave all that aside in order to recollect himself, to reflect on the Word of God, to have more time for prayer, and even to do his own confession. This is the preferred time for the Pope and for some of the principal, the, the, the chief directors of the congregations in the Vatican for reflecting and for repenting and for doing their own confession. So that tells us something of the importance that this time of Lent has. Well, I said that this is a time of training, a time for spiritual exercise, a time to put some effort. And you and I, at this time, are acquiring this, this agreement that we will do our best to make the most for these three occasions in which we gather together for prayer and for reflection. The word battle, it is, the word battle is, is very strong. Battle means that we have enemies. And I suppose this is a difference between the situation of the gym and the situation of the Christian in Lent. When we see people working out in the gym, probably they are not thinking of any particular enemy. The one enemy could be fat. But when we are going through Lent, we are thinking of some enemies we have. And the, the idea is overcoming, winning over these enemies. Which means that the clearer we see the enemies and identify the enemy, the most able we are, the more able we are to overcome them. And that's the whole purpose of today's talk. It is to offer some hints to identify some of the principal enemies we have as Christians. To have some order in this talk, I shall divide my content between the inner battle and the outer battle. The inner battle deals with each one of us 
in as much as we have to struggle to overcome sin and to go beyond our own weaknesses. That's the inner battle. But there's also the outer battle. Catholicism is not a religion just of inner life or um, entering into yourself and just focusing in your own interior. There's something to do out there. We have to be present in many instances of society. And before it is too late, we better should do that. We better do that because our presence, our Catholic voice, our Catholic perspective has to be there. There? Where? Well, that's the point of the second part of this talk. Inner battle, that's the first part. Outer battle, that's the second part. And then we'll take some biblical text, actually from chapter 12 of the letter of St. Paul to the Romans, in order to have some indication, some direction of the way forward. That's today's retreat in this Lenten season. I think because we have about two hours and could be too long for you and for me, we'll have a first talk of about 35 or 40 minutes, then some pause, again a little prayer, and then the second part so as to do the most of this time we have to share our faith. So let's proceed with the inner battle. As I said, the inner battle is whatever you have to do with yourself. This is homework in some sense. This is all about bringing the Word of God and making it possible in our own lives. It's making room for Christ not only as a guest, but as the King and Savior, as the real Lord of our lives. He is the Lord. Curious. That's the word in Greek to signify someone that has the power, the authority. So the inner battle is the process of gaining ground for Christ within ourselves. Even before we think of bearing testimony of Christ to the world, first thing we need is Christ gaining ground within us. So the central question in the inner battle is, is Christ the Lord and Savior of every aspect, every aspect of my life? I suppose many of us have the bad habit of trying to hide from the power of Christ, hide from the sight of Christ, hide from Christ's gospel and mercy, some aspects of our lives. And this is actually reflected and projected when people say, for example, how is it that the church is meddling with me, with my affairs, for example, with my money or with my emotions, my affection, my body, my sexuality. Everything 
that people feel that is so completely their own business, so as to reject any interference from the church, it is, in my experience, something that they are refraining to give up to Christ. So to be a serious Christian is to open everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. What we see as public and what we see as private. Everything, our innermost thoughts and decisions and sentiments and feelings and judgments, and also our thoughts, and projects, and dreams, night dreams and day dreams. Everything that is within us, everything. Only when we submit to Christ, everything that we are, and say, and think, and feel, and search, everything that is in our own interest or connected or related to each one of us. That's taking Christian faith seriously. Of course, this is a battle. This is the inner battle, which is the reason why I have used that word. It is a battle because we constantly try to keep something for us. We see that in the Gospel. The prince among the apostles, Peter, Saint Peter afterwards, at some point he felt that he was giving up too much to Christ and he asked openly, even candidly, he asked Lord, hey Jesus, what's going on? We have given up everything. What will be ours? What will be for us? Which means that being with Christ, being Christian, is quite demanding. Quite demanding. Many people see Christian faith as the sum of everything that we can expect to receive from Christ, which is true, of course. We receive from Christ forgiveness for our sins. We receive from Christ healing in mind and body. We receive from Christ wisdom and purpose and meaning. We receive so many things, so many good things, so many blessings. We receive so much from Christ. But at the same time, Christ is expecting us to receive Him as Savior. And there is a number of passages in the Scripture in which He openly says that. Let me recall some of them with you. When Pontius Pilate asked him, so you are a king. That's, you remember, Christ answered, yes, yes, I am a king. For this I came to the world, to be a king. The fact that Christ is so humble, so meek, so generous, doesn't mean that he's a fool and doesn't mean that he's only to provide to every whim and desire from us. Christ, of course, is so generous. He is so bounteous and he's so powerful. But at the same time, he is the King and Savior. Also, we should remember very well that Christ is God's idea for humankind. God's idea about what it means to be human. 
so that every aspect of our life has to be reshaped, reshaped according to Christ. Admitting Christ, receiving Christ, means a great responsibility. And I am, I'm afraid to say, not all Christians, and probably not many Christians, are really aware of this, that accepting Christ is accepting someone that will meddle, will meddle with every aspect of our lives. Actually, he will meddle with our own businesses in order to transform them and to bless them so that every aspect, every facet of our lives reflects God's glory, God's light. So what's the process for inner battle? And we are coming to the, to the end of this first point. We can make a short list for the inner battle. First point, educate your conscience. One of the readings at the beginning of Lent, I don't remember the exact day, sorry about that, is taken from the prophet Isaiah. I like very much that reading. It is from chapter one of prophet Isaiah. And he says, learn to do good. Avoid to do evil, to do wrong. Which means that we have to learn, we have to question our own ways. Through the mouth of prophet Jeremiah, the Lord said once, ask, ask your ways. Is this the way? Ask your ways. Is this the way? We have to ask that. So the first step is asking ourselves, what I am doing, is this right? That's the proper question. The world attempts to change that question. And there are similar questions. And a different question is, is this convenient? Is this profitable? Is this useful? useful? Is this, or goes this according to my goals and purposes? But the right question to make is, the one that comes out from educating our conscience, is this right? And that's the kind of people we need. We need politicians that begin to ask, is this right? Is this the right thing to do? We don't need any more politicians asking, is this what the people want? That's not the question. The question is, is this right? People in power have to ask themselves, is this right? Teachers and preachers have to ask, is this right? Doctors and nurses have to ask, is this right? I think that's the missing question in many aspects of our society. People have stopped asking this question. They go with the flow. If everything says that, if everyone says it is so, so it will be so. 
We have to be more critical. But the first instance of this question is not to the outside, it is to the inside. It is looking deep within ourselves. Is it right what I am doing? As Catholics, we have many occasions to do this. Think of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We have a very extensive section of the book that is dedicated to the Ten Commandments. Not just doing an archaeological study about what they meant 12 or 13 centuries before Christ. In the Catechism, what we have is a very good study on what these commandments mean for today, and for you, and for me. And that's the kind of question. And that is educating our conscience. Is it right? That's the first step. The second one we have to ask, we have to go forward. Identify your strengths and weaknesses. Do become an expert on your own self. That's the very advice of wise people. Come to know thyself. It is said in that classical language. Know thyself. We say more commonly, know yourself. Come to know yourself. Could you say, at this point, these are my five, or four, whatever, my five main strengths. And these are my, my main five weaknesses. When an architect or an engineer is building up something, they have to take care especially of weak features of their own building. This construction has to be reinforced at that point because it is weak over there. Do you know where you are weak? What are your weaknesses? Do you know yourself to the point of saying, I tend to become a fake Christian. I came to betray my Savior on this aspect of my life. This is what really, really is difficult for me. That's the second point. Third point. Be honest about your own failures. Blaming others does not help. I'm really, I'm really disappointed. As of late, I am really disappointed seeing so many leaders and celebrities that have repeated recently, I have nothing to be sorry about. I have nothing to repent about. Politicians, singers, actresses, even scientists, people that make abortions, they have nothing to repent about. That's very sad. That's very sad, isn't it? These people are really doing so many things, some of them good, many of them evil, no sign of repentance. They learned nothing from the time they had that power. Eight years in power, the president of the government in Spain, eight years in government, he widened largely, he widened laws about admitting abortion, destroying the family. I have nothing to be repented. I lament nothing, that's not a worry for me. 
This is the reason for this third advice. Be honest with yourself. I think it has become a sort of luxury to be able to repent. It is so rare nowadays. It is so rare. And I suppose that's part of the reason for people coming to confession so rarely. Because it is so rare to admit that one has so many failures and sins and misdeeds. And we all have them. But we have real difficulty in admitting that. Probably part of the reason is our own pride or part of the reason is that we don't know enough about God's mercy. It is so good when we come to the Lord and we submit ourselves as guilty people and then we come back we go back from confession as forgiven people. Number four, be compassionate about your true nature. Be honest was number three. Be compassionate is number four. And they seem to be in conflict with each other, but in Christian faith they are in happy agreement. At the same time, we have to be very honest, even harsh. I am a sinner. That's harsh. That's difficult to hear. I am a sinner. Okay, admit that. And at the same time say, there's forgiveness for me. With the same tone with the same loudness, with the same loudness, say to yourself, there's forgiveness for me. I am a sinner, there's forgiveness for me. Both are true and both capture very appropriately. They capture the essence of Christian conversion. If you don't admit your sins, there's no possibility of conversion. Land will be wasted for you. No use of land in your life. I am a sinner, that's the conclusion. Well, not the full conclusion. The full conclusion is, I am a sinner. There's forgiveness for me. There's pardon, there's mercy. Then number five, be proactive on what should change in and around yourself. You see that this is very similar to the process of going to confess. This is exactly what we do when we go to confession. We admit what we are, we repent with a contrite heart, we say what we are, we are honest, but we trust in God's mercy. We receive pardon. But even before we receive pardon and forgiveness, we have a clear purpose of what should change in our lives. And this is the very importance of knowing oneself. Only people that really and honestly know themselves are able to say, I should change this. And only when we say, I should change this, this aspect of my life, there's real progress in spiritual life. Because saying a so general purposes, I wish I was a better person, that has no power. I wish I was a better person. Oh, me too. Everybody would wish to be a better person. That has no real impact in your life. It's a different story. When you see, for example, I'm truly wasting my time. 
watching two hours and a half of television every day. Television, the TV, the TV set is killing me. So I need less time with the TV set, more time, I don't know, reading or praying or spending time with your children. Something that is different. What I mean is, the clearer you see what is ruining your spiritual life, the clearer you see what is destroying your good purpose, the clearer you also see what has to change in your life. And that's number five in our set of advices, recommendations. Number six, I like this one. Join a community, join a community of faith. Community of faith. We are saved in a personal way, but not individual way. I like to make a difference between personal and individual. What I understand by individual is whatever is considered separated from the rest of the group of the community. We are taken seriously by God as members of the human family, as members of our community. If you see, if you read the New Testament, you won't find, barely you could find a single example of someone that changes his or her life by his own, this doesn't happen. If you think, for example, of the conversion of Apostle St. Paul, you could say this was an individual conversion. He was with other people, they were going to Damascus, and on the way, almost coming to Damascus, you know the story, he fell to the ground, he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul answered, who are you? I am Jesus. You could say this was an individual conversion. It was just Paul and Jesus. That encounter was central. But what followed? After that, what was the next step? Next step was, he remained blind and then another person, Ananias, was called to come to Paul's house where he was lodging. He was called, Ananias was called to go to that place and to pray over Paul's blindness and to administer the sacrament of baptism. It wasn't Paul baptizing himself. It wasn't Paul taking his blindness off. It wasn't Paul as an individual. He was called to be part of a community and from the very beginning he was taught that his conversion was part of the tree of life, the new tree of life, which is the church. And please do remember, it is only the living branches that receive the tree sap. It is only belonging to a living community. So I, I hope, I really hope that as a fruit of this Lenten retreat, if you haven't done that before, you take a clear decision of joining some of the groups or communities of your parish, 
if this is your parish or wherever that you belong to. Be part of something. Be part of a community. It's only in community that we learn the best possible way who we are. I remember a very clever sentence from St. Francis of Assisi. I knew only the Spanish version, so I attempt to translate that into English. It's something like, everyone is so humble if undisturbed. We are so humble. And I can say, my friends, I am the humblest, humblest person in the world. I am, provided nobody meddles with me, nobody disturbs my plans and projects. Community, community means other people interfering with my way, with my manner of doing things, with my style, with my wishes, with... And that interference is so necessary so that what is true in myself comes up to the surface. In community, I learn I am not, not even half as humble as I thought I was. I am not. I am not. Am I ready to forgive people? If you ask someone that lives by himself, oh yes, it is really easy to forgive people. Okay, put that person in community. Which is one of the reasons why in the new canon law, new means 1983, <laughs> which is not, it's 30 years ago already, but 30 years in the life of the church is new. In the new canon law, we see that Christian life has many examples of full realization, but to be by oneself is not, no longer presented as the maximum expression of Christian life. Yes, there are hermits. Yes, that's true. It's an accepted way of life in the church. Hermits, they live by themselves, is each one in his particular place. Yes, that's possible. And if they, if they are, doing penance and prayer, of course, they are united in some spiritual sense with the rest of the church. But the true example of Christian life is not necessarily that one. And this is important. And finally, we come to the end of our first half of today's reflections. Share, share what you have learned. Don't keep for yourself everything you have received. The church needs your talent. The church needs the gifts the Holy Spirit has given to you. The church needs what you, you can make possible with the power and the blessing of God that is unique for you. You are not a photocopy. You are not the repetition. You are not the re-edition of someone else. You are unique. And the gifts you have received are not just for yourself. So this is the inner battle, my friends. This is what we are invited to do during Lent, educating our conscience, identifying our strengths, strengths and weaknesses, being honest, being compassionate, being proactive, 
joining a community and sharing what we have received. In the second part of today's reflection, we are about to think about the outer battle, because this is just what we need as persons. This is homework for the church, but we have so much to do when we think in the role of the church in the world. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit,